Muy buenos días a todos. Agradecemos su presencia en esta última sesión del seminario Fronteras en Sistemática, Evolución y Biodiversidad que lanzamos este año en el Instituto de Biología. Hoy es eh, la última sesión de este primer ciclo en el cual hemos tenido el gran privilegio de tener a ponentes de diferentes lugares del mundo tomando, tocando una diversidad de temas que son de interés para nuestra comunidad. Hoy, diría yo, pues cerramos con broche de oro con una presentación del profesor Enrico Cohen que ha realmente proporcionado paradigmas respecto a nuestro entendimiento del de desarrollo de la estructura floral. No voy a prolongarme mucho porque será nuestro eh, querido colega, el doctor Ulises Rosas, quien hará la presentación. Yo solamente quería hablarles a ustedes, eh, recordarles que eh, pronto vamos a abrir una convocatoria para que ustedes nos den sugerencias de posibles ponentes para el próximo año. Eh, sin más, le cedo la palabra a Ulises para que nos eh, dé eh, la presentación del profesor Cohen. Muchas gracias. Adelante, Ulises. Muchas gracias, Susana. Y pues para mí es un placer eh, hacer la presentación del profesor Enrico Cohen, o también conocido como Rico. Eh, muchas gracias, Rico, por aceptar la, la, la invitación para dar este seminario. Thanks a lot, Rico, for accepting this invitation. Uh, from now on, I'm going to give the, the introduction in, in Spanish. I hope you don't mind. Uh, el profesor Enrico Cohen, o mejor conocido como Rico Cohen, es uno de los investigadores más brillantes y prominentes del desarrollo de la biología del desarrollo vegetal, gracias a sus numerosas contribuciones que han abierto diversos campos de estudio en su momento. Dentro de estas contribuciones, me, permitice, me permitiré citar ampliamente eh, el conocido modelo ABC de la determinación de los verticilos florales, por ejemplo, o la genética de la determinación de la simetría floral, o la genética de la construcción de la complejidad de la inflorescencia de las angiospermas. Y también pues, ha sido autor de uno de los primeros ejemplos de fenómenos epigenéticos en especies naturales. Y de hecho, más reciente, también ha estado sentando las bases del entendimiento y del cómo es que los organismos crecen y se desarrollan en formas altamente complejas a través de modelajes biofísicos, matemáticos, de los procesos biológicos. Gracias a la relevancia de sus contribuciones, el profesor Enrico Cohen ha sido reconocido como miembro del Royal Society, como miembro del US National Academy of Sciences, ha sido presidente del Genetic Society y ha recibido la condecoración de comandante del Imperio Británico, entre otras distinciones. Los trabajos del profesor Rico Cohen generalmente se publican en las revistas científicas más prestigiosas como Science, Nature, Plant Cell, Plus Biology, Current Biology, entre otras. Asimismo, el profesor Cohen es un excelente comunicador de la ciencia y ha escrito dos libros, el primero de ellos, titulado The Art of Genes, que también ha sido traducido al español, y el segundo, From Cells to Civilizations, obras en las cuales el profesor Cohen también ha plasmado con ideas provocativas su filosofía y entendimiento de los procesos evolutivos, tema que ha, que ha captado su interés desde hace décadas y de las cuales eh, nos, ha, nos hablará el día de hoy. Es así que le damos la bienvenida al profesor Rico Cohen, y como siempre esperamos sus preguntas y comentarios para que al final del seminario puedan interactuar con el ponente a través de este chat. Eh, en unos minutos, en unos, unos segundos, daremos eh, comienzo a, este, a esta charla del profesor Cohen.
Perdón, nos dice en nuestra audiencia que no hay que no hay audio. Déjenme corregir esto. Un segundo, un segundo. Disculpen las, las, eh, la demora, tengo un problema técnico, pero en un segundo lo arreglo, si me permiten. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to give a seminar at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. I'd like you to imagine that you're a Martian who's landed on Earth and is going around trying to make sense of the strange objects that humans make. And the first thing that strikes you is that humans tended to make objects that were tailored to the environment. So a snowmobile has skis that allowed it to travel quickly over the snow. Cars have wheels that allow them to zoom across roads. Uh, a boat has a nicely shaped hull that allows it to skim over the water. But one day you happen to be in Norwich, which is the town I come from, and you decide you're a bit bored with Norwich, so you teleport yourself to Mexico City. And then you notice something very peculiar, because in Norwich, cars, dri drivers drive on the left, whereas in Mexico City, they drive on the right. Now, it's not clear that this has anything to do with an adaptation or a tailoring to the environment, because it's totally unclear why driving on the left or driving on the right would be better suited in one place rather than the other. It's clear that driving on one side is a good idea, but which side seems to be an arbitrary one. So why, are, why this difference? And then you notice something else very strange. You notice that in Norwich, school signs have children on a white background with a red triangle, But in Mexico, warning signs have uh, the children on a yellow background and a black outline. So again, why is there this difference? It seems to be we're dealing with equally equivalent solutions rather than an adaptation to an environment. So you're curious about this and you decide to map these differences over the whole of the globe. And you find that driving on the right, which side you drive on, is very territory dependent. So you find clear boundaries between some regions where you drive on the left and other regions where you drive on the right. And uh, if you look at road signs, you find the same thing. You find again, sharp boundaries between, for example, warning signs that have a yellow background versus warning signs that have other backgrounds. So here it doesn't seem that we're dealing with an adaptation to an environment. We're dealing with something that seems to be territorial, the historical, and often seems to involve equivalent solutions rather than optimization of a single solution. Now we encounter the same sort of issue when we look at biological variation, because in a way, as biologists trying to understand the natural world, we're rather like Martians trying to understand something that is rather foreign and strange to us. And again, what we see, first of all, is adaptation. We see that the frog and the lily are both adapted to an aquatic environment, that the polar bear and the pine trees are adapted and suited to a snowy, cold environment, and the cheetah and the grass are adapted to a sunny, dry environment. But again, we find that there are some exceptions, some curious exceptions to this type of rule. If you look at these flowers, you'll see that this one has four petals, this one has five petals, and this one has six. Now this trait as to, as to petal number is highly conserved within each of these species. It doesn't vary within a population, indicating it's under strict selection. It's, it's an important trait. And yet we see that there is variation between these species 
indicating that one species can do very well with four, one can do very well with five, and one can do very well with six. So it doesn't seem to matter terribly much which number you have, but within a species, you stick to that number very rigidly. Again, we seem to be dealing with an equivalent solution that's consistent within each population, but varies between populations or between species in this case. Here's another example. This is an Antirhinum species, Antirhinum pseudomagus or snapdragon. And these flowers are pollinated by bees that enter a specific entry point. And it's very important that this uh, position is signposted to assist with the bee's entry and facilitate pollination and the spread of pollen. Now there are two closely related species or subspecies of, of this flower. One has yellow flowers and signposts the entry with a magenta veins over the uh, over a yellow background and another subspecies has magenta flowers and advertises the entry point with this strong yellow color just at the point of entry. So again we seem to be dealing with two equivalent solutions, two different types of signposts that have evolved. It's unclear why it would have chosen one versus the other and yet we see consistency within each population. And so the question is, how do these uh, traits evolve and how do we think about these types of trait? And what do they tell us about evolution in general? Well, to address this issue, we're gonna to have to think about the relationship between genotype and phenotype and two aspects of this relationship. One is the relationship related to gene function, which is how you go from genotype to phenotype within a single generation. So how is it that genes function to transform, for example, uh, a fertilized egg into an adult phenotype? The other uh, question though, is the feedback from phenotype to genotype, which is over multiple generations and operates through fitness. So through natural selection, for example, the phenotype gradually, selection operating on the phenotype can eventually change the genotype. So the genotype evolves over time. And whereas function operates within a single generation, fitness typically operates over multiple generations. So we're going to need to think about both of these aspects if we're going to tackle our problem. And both of them, incidentally, are influenced by the environment. The environment can influence how something develops, how an organism develops, and also the environment influences uh, and influences the type of fitness that each genotype has. Now, the system we're going to do to address this is uh, the snapdragon flower, and I'm going to first deal with function, how the genes that we're going to be talking about operate and have their effects. So here again are these two uh, species shown or subspecies shown in a cartoon form. And we know quite a lot about the genes involved in making the difference between these two patterns of flower color. But it basically involves three major genes called Rosea, Eluta, and Sulfuria. And these two species have complementary alleles at these three loci. So let's first think about how these genes function, how they operate to influence the phenotype. And first let's talk about the genes controlling magenta color, and then we'll talk about yellow. So considering magenta, if we start with uh, the, uh, this genotype, which is recessive at the Rosea lupus, and dominant for the, uh, the Eluta locus, carries the dominant allele at the Eluta. It has a white uh, background, but just with these veins focused at this uh, entry point. If we now introduce the recessive Eluta allele, you see that the veins now spread over the back petals. Okay, so Eluta is a gene that's restricting the, the wild type or the dominant allele is normally restricting the distribution of the veins. If we now introduce the dominant Rosea allele, we end up with magenta color all the way around. So Rosea is promoting the production of pigment throughout the flower, from the, the magenta pigment. And these genes have been cloned and they've been shown to encode transcription factors, MIB transcription factors you know, that switch on target genes that then produce the enzymes that drive pigment production. What about yellow? So uh, yellow, if we start, is controlled by a gene called sulfuria or sulf. And if we start with the recessive uh, genotype, recessive sulf, it has spread yellow all over the flower. But if we now introduce the dominant sulfuria uh, allele, then we'll end up with res yellow restricted just to this patch um, where the bee enters the flower. All right, so do dominant sulfuria is inhibiting the distribution of yellow pigment. 
It turns out sulfuria is not a transcription factor, but it influences transcripts in a slightly different way. So here's a gene, the gene involved CGT, that's involved in the producing an enzyme involved uh, needed for the production of the yellow pigment, CGT. And then and sulfuria is an inverted duplication of part of this gene. And what it does is it produces, because it's an inverted duplication, it produces small RNAs that then bind to the transcript and cause it to be diced up and thus reducing pigment production. So sulfuria then is a dominant allele that represses uh, transcription or, the, or transcript levels um, through the small RNA mechanism. So all the loci that I've talked about effectively modulate transcription or modulate transcription levels, but through slightly different mechanisms, in some case transcription factors, and in some case through small RNAs. We've seen how genotype influences phenotype through the function of three genes which control the transcript levels of their targets. But what about the mapping from phenotype back to genotype? How do alleles at these loci influence fitness? So about 20 years ago, I was chatting with an ecological geneticist, uh, Christophe Thibault, and I was telling him about our work on uh, antirhinum and the function of the various genes. And he said to me, well, it's all very well studying these gene functions, but what's going on in natural populations? What's, what about natural variation? So we decided after this conversation to go on a road trip round uh, through antirhinum country, which antirhinums grow in um, the Mediterranean, south of France and Spain. So it wasn't difficult for him to convince me. And we started going, driving around, looking at the distribution of the different antirhinum species. And um, I remember driving along one road in particular in Spain. Um, and along this road, we were seeing magenta flowers because we were looking at antirhinum pseudomagus. And we knew that somewhere further along, we would encounter yellow flowered species. Um, so we were expecting we would go along the road, we'd see magenta, more magenta, magenta flowers, magenta flowers. And we were expecting we'd end up with a gap and then we would encounter the yellow flowers. But I remember turning, the we were in the car, turning just this corner here, and we saw something amazing. We saw a whole range of different flower colours, ranging from yellow, oranges, whites, flowers, you know, a whole spectrum of different phenotypes. And as we kept driving, that lasted for about a kilometre or two, and then we started to see the yellows. So it looked like we were dealing here with a hybrid zone, a hybridization between these two species, a natural hybridization. Now, although I was completely stunned by this, uh, I'd never, didn't expect to see it at all, Christoph did actually have an inkling that we might find this. And the reason is that before going on our trip, he didn't tell me this, but before going on our trip, he'd gone to the London Natural History Museum and found an, a specimen, a herbarium specimen of antirhinum, and um, on this specimen, which was collected in 1928, uh, tw 93 years ago, was a little note that said, this group displays a marvelous color polymorphism on the left bank or the left slope of the Rebast Valley. And that's exactly where we were. And so that polymorphism was there 93 years ago. It was still there 20 years ago, and it's still there now. So it's been there uh, for quite a long time. Now, the fact that we've seen this variation means that we, because we've got the loci involved in the flower color variation, the three loci, we can ask what happens to the allele frequency at these three different loci as we drive or sample across this hybrid zone. And it turns out that the frequency of these alleles uh, drops, shows a start, sharp climbs uh, for each of these loci, sulfuria, rosea, and aluta, as we pass through this uh, hybrid zone. And it's about a kilometer or two wide, this, this very sharp drop in um, allele frequency. And so the alleles are reflecting, in a sense, the variation in flower color. And there's two explanations of what's going on here. One is that selection is somehow preventing alleles from flowing at these flower color loci between the species or between the subspecies. Alternatively, maybe these two populations Although they've been in contact for 93 years at least, maybe there hasn't been enough time for their genomes to, to mix. And what we're seeing here is just 
uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the genome. So to follow this up, we wanted to quantify variation in, in genomic variation, not just at these three loci, but across the genome. And for this, we wanted a particular measure of genomic diversity. And the measure that I'm going to show you is based, in a sense, on the same principles that taxonomists have using, been using for years and years or centuries to classify um, organisms. So taxonomists, for example, if you show a taxonomist a group of species such as this, all of which have four petals, and over here you see a group of species that all have five petals, then you would say, well, this is a good character. Petals are a good character for discriminating between these different species groups, all right, because the character is discrete. Okay, we have four versus five, and it's distinctive. All of these have one number, and all of these have another number. Now, flower pigment would not be a very good character because although it's, uh, it's uh, discrete, you can see diff very sharp differences in flower color, it's not distinctive. The variation in flower color within uh, this group of species is as much as the variation between the two groups. So taxonomists tend to look for characters that are discrete and distinctive. Now, when we come to look at genomic variation, we want to measure, uh, capture that idea mathematically. And the measure that captures that is um, what's called the fixation index or FST, because FST is a measure of the variation called pi b, the variation between the populations, minus the difference between that and the variation within populations. And it's the difference between compared to within divided by the total that gives us this measure of FST. But the characters that we're going to use to measure now are not uh, visible characters such as flower petal number, but um, DNA characters uh, nucleotide polymorphisms. So that's going to be our discrete character and we're going to be using FST to measure the uh, relative divergence in this character to give us a sense of how distinctive the populations are. So to do this we uh, sampled, we went back to the hybrid zone and we sampled a whole bunch of yellow plants and created what we call a yellow pool. We sampled a whole bunch of magenta plants, we call them magenta pool, and then we sequenced the two pools. And here's an example. So here we see, for example, uh, sequences derived from the magenta pool. And here are sequences derived from the yellow uh, or striatum pool. And you'll see there's variation at particular loci, but they tell, uh, or there's polymorphisms, but some of these polymorphisms tell different things. So for example, if you look at the polymorphism on the right, you'll see that although there is a polymorphism, the within population variation for this polymorphism, A and T, is the same as the between population variation. And so when we calculate FST for this position, we see that the value is zero. Whereas if you look on the left, you'll see that here's a diagnostic site where they're all, uh, there's no variation within each population, but they're distinctive between populations and that yields an FST of one. And we can have intermediate situations uh, which give us intermediate values of FST. So now we can scan along the genome um, for FST to see which regions are, of the genome are giving us very distinctive um, signatures. And if you do this, this just shows the result for chromosome six. You'll see that by and large, the chromosome doesn't have much variation except for one position at the end of chromosome six. And if you find out, ask what is that region, it turns out it's where the rosea and eluta genes map, the genes controlling flower pigmentation. So that tells us that these clines or these barriers are not applying to the whole genome. It's not that these two species haven't had time to exchange alleles or exchange information. The, uh, because most of the genome, or most of the chromosome in this case, the, there is very little differentiation between the two species. But only at this position, where the flower color loci are, are we seeing this distinctive signature. So there's something specific going on at the flower color loci that is preventing these alleles from being exchanged between the populations and giving us this steep climb. Now we can look, zoom out and look at the whole genome, all the chromosomes, and uh, as, as again we see here's uh, Rosea eluta, the peak on chromosome six. 
Sulfuria doesn't give a very big peak. We think that that's because uh, sulfuria, if you remember, is an inverted duplication. And um, the alleles in the striatum species um, have overlapping deletions, which may be confounding uh, the genotyping and the um, sequence variation. So that's why we think maybe sulfuria doesn't show a peak. But um, there is another peak that's very striking over here on chromosome two. And the question is, what is that peak? Could it be another flower color locus that we were unaware of? Or could it be some other trait um, that's being influenced or that's being prevented from being exchanged between these two populations? So to address that, what we did was we generated an F2 and we genotyped the F2 for the known flower color genes and then asked, could it be that there's a residual gene that we hadn't picked up before that is influencing flower color? And the result of that is shown here. So here you're seeing plants that are recessive rosea, uh, recessive sulfuria, so they've been genotyped here. They're also dominant eluta, so we know what's going on with the other loci. And now we can look at the residual variation and ask what is going on with regard to the genotyping of this, uh, of this island on chromosome two. And if we take SNPs near that island, you find that the ones that have the striatum allele are pretty strongly yellow, whereas the ones that have the uh, allele from pseudomagus, the recessive allele, have essentially much less yellow. So we have another locus then involved in flower color, in this case yellow, that we hadn't spotted before. And this is mapping to chromosome two and creating um, this island. And um, if we look at what this gene FLA, we name this gene Flavia for yellow. Uh, we ask what, what does this gene do? What is its function? It turns out it encodes the CGT gene. Remember that is the gene that is being targeted by the inverted duplication at sulfuria by, by these small RNAs. So Flavia is the target gene that encodes the enzyme that is being downregulated by the sulfuria gene. So now we have um, another gene, Flavia, as well as the other loci. And if we look at the uh, climb, we see that that also shows a steep change in allele frequency as we go across the hybrid zone, although it's less steep than, for example, the Rosier gene or the Rosier alleles. So again, we seem to have another locus under selection, and again, it's, under, uh, it's involved in flower color. So now we have two loci affecting yellow flower color. We have, in addition to sulfuria, we have the flower gene. And if you have the reset, if we start off with the yellow, solid yellow flower here of striatum, if you add in the recessive flower allele, you end up with yellow in a only around the B entry point. This we, we think is because flower, this, this allele carries a cis-acting mutation that causes expression of this gene only in this yellow domain. And then if you add in sulfuria, this uh, inverted repeat, then that generates an even more restricted yellow, which is what you see in Antioinum pseudomagus, the genotype over here. So now we have, in a sense, two axes uh, in our uh, genetic control. We have axis, the, what the vertical axis controlling the amount of yellow and two loci contributing to that, flower and sol. We have another axis controlling the amount of magenta, rosea and diluta. And Antirhinum magus, uh, pseudomagus lies in this corner of our diagram, whereas striatum lies in this corner. And if we have other combinations, uh, other genotypes, we will end up with other, uh, other phenotypes. So, for example, this combination will give us a white flower with a yellow highlight, and this one gives us uh, an orange flower. And those are the phenotypes that are arising at the hybrid zone when these two species meet. But the question is, why is it, what is it that's stopping the alleles at these two species from introgressing and being shared? What's stopping the rosea and diluta alleles from one species or subspecies moving in to the other species? And therefore, what's keeping this barrier between the species in terms of allele frequencies uh, so sharp? Well, one idea is it's to do with the fitness of these hybrid uh, genotypes. So we therefore wanted to measure the fitness of these plants in the wild. And to do that, we decided to sample uh, individuals over multiple generations. We would go back to the hybrid zone, multiple generations again and again, every year, and try and see how many progeny, by genotyping, how many progeny each individual 
would leave. So this again is a hybrid zone. And what I'm going to show you is a movie in which we're going to go through, along this road and show you the individual plants that have been sampled um, in, in one particular year. As we go along the road, you'll see the individual plants sampled and I've, I've color coded the pins. Each pin that you'll see is, is a single plant and we've color coded it such that the uh, mag magenta flowered ones have a magenta pin, orange ones have an orange pin, white ones have a white pin and yellow ones have a yellow pin. And you'll see that as we go through, the frequency of these pin colors changes as we go from magenta at one end through to the yellow at the other end. So I'm now gonna show you this movie. So in collaboration with Nick Barton and David Field, we genotyped each individual every year with hundreds of SNPs. And by comparing SNPs from one year to the next, we could calculate how many individuals each individual left in subsequent generations. So this shows along the top here, you can see each dot represents a single individual. And as we go from one year to the next, we started to calculate, shown by these lines, these solid lines, which individual in one generation gave rise to which progeny in subsequent generation. And from that, we could calculate the fitness of each individual. What was the reproductive success of each different phenotype? And based on that, you can build what's called a fitness landscape. And that's shown on the next slide, where the height of this indicates the fitness of, of, of the different phenotypes. And you can see that the the phenotypes with the highest fitness are those at the corners, the ones that have the phenotype characteristic of the two parental species, striatum and pseudomagus, whereas hybrid genotypes have a lower fitness. Okay, so they leave fewer progeny. And that's consistent with this idea that the barrier to the gene flow of the color genes is due to the reduced fitness selection against the hybrid genotypes preventing these alleles from flowing from one population to the other. We've seen how selection has been acting specifically on flower color to prevent flow of alleles between different populations, and that this likely operates through reduced fitness of hybrid genotypes. But why flower color? Is there something special about flower color? Or is it that we've been biased by its visual attractiveness to zero in onto this type of variation? Well, to address this issue, we wanted to look at variation in a more unbiased way. To do this, we decided to sample populations uh, beyond the hybrid zone. So in this orange box here, you can see the populations I've been talking about so far, just at the hybrid zone where these two uh, subspecies meet. But we now sampled all over the, uh, their distribution. So we found broadly for Antirhinum striatum and also for and magenta populations, Mantirhinum pseudomagus. And we then decided to ignore flower color. Okay, so we now have gone colorblind. We ignore flower color and we ask purely in terms of the genome and FST variation, to what extent might do we spot barriers to gene flow and structure in this population that allows us to separate it into different groupings. It's like we were a Martian who's come down to Earth, who's colorblind and can only see FST values when comparing populations. And the question is, what would such a Martian see? How would the Martian categorize these populations into, into different groupings based purely in terms of FST? So if you take most regions of the genome, what you find is that when you compare these different populations, you don't see anything particularly interesting. You see that they're distributed 
more or less evenly when you compare their FST uh, scores. In other words, you end up with a unimodal distribution of FST values across all these population comparisons. So there's no obvious structure. Some regions give you uh, outlier distributions where one population is distinct uh, from all the other populations, all right, showing a sort of bimodal distribution but with uh, an obvious outlier. But these aren't particularly interesting because they might just reflect peculiarities of individual populations. The most interesting category are these, where you end up with a bimodal distribution where you have a separation into two clusters. All right, so this is a bimodal distribution with a dip in the middle, but now we have two uh, separate, separate types of cluster. And this is telling us that in, for this region of the genome, we have some sort of uh, partitioning between two groups of uh, populations. And the question is what uh, are this category of uh, values or windows, what sort of genes are involved in creating this type of categorization. Well, when you analyze uh, all the windows across the genome, you find that the vast majority give you these uh, unimodal distributions. So they don't tell you much uh, about population structures. There are 97 with non-unimodal distributions that give you some sort of separation, but those with visibly distinct clusters uh, there's only 38 that give you clear groupings into two uh, distinct clusters. And when we look at what's in what those windows comprise, the sorts of genes that are in there, what we find is that 32 of these 38 derive from the flower locus, the gene involved in flower color. Another five derive from the Ros L locus, another flower color gene. And only one locus derives from something new. So that's already telling us that it's the flower color genes are standing out again. It's not that the flower color genes are standing out because we were biased by looking for flower color. The flower color genes are actually standing out because um, they are the ones that are the only genes by and large that are giving you this clustering phenomenon, that are giving you a categorization. And just to illustrate that, we can look at the clusters generated by some of these loci. So here's a window from the Ros L region, and you can see that it's clustering according to flower color, which is what you expect because this is a flower color gene. And so it's partitioning the population uh, according to flower color. Uh, if you look at the flower region, you'll see that that also partitions broadly according to flower color. You'll see there are two yellow populations here uh, that are near to the magenta populations. These actually derive from very near to the hybrid zone. And we think that this is because a region of the flower locus has actually introgressed into the uh, uh, between, between from the yellow populations into the magenta populations. And so you're getting uh, this clustering for flower. But what about this uh, extra locus, the locus that does not correspond to one of the known flower color genes? What trait does this locus affect? Well, when we cluster according to this locus, we see the clustering that it generates. We see that actually it again seems to divide the populations according to flower color. We get the yellow population segregated away from the magenta populations. So it looks like this locus may be yet another one involved in flower color that we hadn't spotted. So to test that idea, we went back to our populations, our F3 populations, genotyped everything for the low side that we knew about and to see if there was any residual variation that might be accounted for by this locus. And that's shown on this slide. So here we've genotyped all the individuals so they're fixed at the ROS, SOLF, FLA, and also ELUTA loci. And now we're genotyping uh, for the uh, polymorphism of this additional locus. And what we see is that when uh, individuals are homozygous for the striatum allele of this locus, they have more yellow than when they're homozygous for the pseudomagus allele of this locus. So it again argues that this locus, which we now call chromosa, is yet another flower color gene. We've seen how flower color genes stand out as discriminators between populations. And this is not because we've been biased by their visible effects. So what is it that makes flower color genes so special? We can get some insights by going back to our example of driving on the left and driving on the right. Now, in most cases, countries that drive on opposite sides of the road 
don't meet. So they're separated by barriers, for example, sea barriers or mountain barriers. But sometimes the situation of going from one type of convention to the other type of convention does arise. And for example, Hong, in Hong Kong, you drive on the left. But what happens when you drive into mainland China, where people drive on the right? What's going to stop people colliding with each other? Well, people have tried to come up with various solutions in dealing with the problem. And here's one type of solution, a bridge, a proposed bridge between Hong Kong and China, in which drivers on one side would be taken naturally onto the other side of the road. And it illustrates the point that with driving on the left and driving on the right, you have an incompatibility, a potential sort of disaster waiting to happen if these two solutions, which each work very well on their own, driving on the left or driving on the right, meet. Uh, we end up with hybrid combinations which would not work very well. And that's rather similar to the situation we have with our hybrid zone, where these two different types of flower colour pattern meet and hybrids don't function very well. Now, this situation that we see with driving on the left and driving on the right is rather atypical, however. In many cases, cultural traits do not show these barriers. For example, in Norwich, here's, here's a Starbucks uh, coffee shop in Norwich, and here's a similar Starbucks coffee house in Mexico City. So in this case, there is no problem with Starbucks spreading from one country uh, to another, and so you find Starbucks everywhere, because there is no problem with hybrid incompatibility. There's no barrier to a trait such as uh, Starbucks spreading. So I would argue that most alleles, most alleles in a population are going to be like Starbucks. They'll freely exchange between populations. And if something's advantageous in one population, it can spread into other populations. It's very unusual to have uh, alleles that show the uh, this type of trait, the incompatibility trait, uh, that's a much smaller proportion of the genome. And uh, the, the characteristics you need for this to happen is that each solution works well on its own, but the hybrids do not work well. And that's the situation we find with flower color, because in this case, we can formalize it with this sort of adaptive landscape. We're dealing with two peaks on an adaptive landscape and a valley in between. So for each of these peaks, we have a set of co-adaptive genes that give each type of solution to the problem of, of attracting the pollinator to an entry point, but the hybrid combinations don't work, work very well. And this is a very rare type of uh, landscape that only applies uh, to a few traits and a few genes. And it so happens that flower color is one of those, partly because for flower color to create this syndrome of attracting the bee, you need a certain combination of gene activities to work well with each other. And moreover, because flower color is involved in sexual selections under strong sexual selection, it's potentially a rapidly evolving trait. And so maybe that's why we've ended up with this situation of an incompatibility only for the flower color loci because of their very specific type of fitness landscape or adaptive landscape and because they're under strong sexual selection. But that raises now a new problem, which is how in evolution do you ever go from one type of uh, pattern to the other type of pattern without traversing this fitness valley? Because in evolution, you'd ha you don't not normally go down. Selection doesn't operate such as that you go down in fitness. You go up towards higher fitness. So how did this fitness valley get uh, traversed during our e during the evolutionary history of these species? So to explain that, we're going to take a, a top-down view of the fitness landscape as shown here. From this view, we can see that the hybrid genotypes that I showed you earlier fall into the region of low fitness in these low fitness domains. And this makes a prediction. It predicts that if we were to look at different species of antirhinum, we wouldn't see species with orange flowers or species with white flowers because these have low fitness. So what is it that you find? Well, when you look at the ra full range of antirhinum species across the whole of Spain and the Mediterranean, you see that indeed there are no species with orange flowers. But there are species with white flowers. Okay, there are several species that have white flowered backgrounds, which is not what you would have predicted from the fitness landscape that I've just shown you. When you look at these white flowered species, you see that they occupy very specific regions or small 
specialized locations within the distribution. So here in Spain, these white patches show you where you find these white flowered species. They're in highly localized habitats. And when you go and see what's special about these habitats, you see that these species are actually growing on very steep cliffs. So here's one clinging onto the cliff. And if we zoom in to that plant, what you'd see is it has white flowers with these yellow markings, and it's growing on a cliff and it has a spreading habit. The leaves spread over the cliff and perhaps the white flowers in this context are uh, attractive because they're only illuminated from one side. They're on a dark background and perhaps that's why you find uh, the white flowered form surviving. Whereas if you, this contrasts to the situation of something like Antirhinum pseudomagus or Antirhinum striatum, which grows on slopes, and where the, the plant grows erect, okay, it doesn't cling to the ground, it grows erect and it, dis, it holds its flowers away uh, so that they're illuminated from all sides. And maybe in this context, we find that um, the yellow or the magenta signposts uh, are more favored, they have higher fitness. So let's go back now and revisit our landscapes in the light of this. So now we have dealing with two environments and habits uh, we're dealing with the slope environment or erect habit, uh, and then the uh, cliff environment, the steep cliff environment, and the spreading habit. And if we look at our adaptive landscape so far, we've only been considering la landscapes on slopes with the erect habit, and we saw that pseudomagus, uh, sorry, striatum and pseudomagus occupy distinct peaks, distinct regions of high fitness, indicated by the red here, distinct regions of high fitness separated by a fitness valley. But now when we go to uh, a cliff or spreading uh, habit, we see that the position of the peak has shifted to the white genotype position. And so we see that rather than uh, these peaks being completely separate, which they are, if we only consider this environment and habit, we see that they're actually connected with each other via the white flowered genotype, as long as we consider an alternative environment inhabit. So the two species or these different phenotypes are indeed connected or could be connected through a path of high fitness which evolution could take. So how could evolution have taken this path? So let's imagine we have an ancestor that's growing on the cliff and it has white flowers with a red focus um, and it has this spreading habit. Now this plant, these species, will be producing seed all the time that disperses into the slopes nearby but it won't these species won't get established by and large or these variants won't get established by and large but occasionally what i'm going to call genetic pioneers might get established so that they manage to get a foothold in these uh, slope environments they they maybe somehow manage to adapt or are adapted to some extent and as they uh, get established and they adapt further they develop uh, a new habit uh, with the erect habit allowing them to um, grow better and, and reproduce better on these sloping environments. And as they develop an erect habit, so their flowers now become lifted away from the background and you have now two possible solutions to attracting the pollinators. One is to evolve the yellow flowers with this erect habit and the, uh, with the magenta highlight. The other possible solution is to go for magenta flowers with the yellow highlight. So both of these are equally good solutions and it's going to be a matter of chance whether a population follows this path or the other path. And each will do very fine on its own until the populations come into contact. And should they come into contact, then you'll end up with a barrier such that only the flower color genes will be prevented from exchanging between these two populations. Whereas, because they're the ones that show an incompatibility, they provide their incompatible independent solutions, whether the rest of the genome, most of the other genes which don't show this uh, characteristic adaptive peaks will freely exchange. And so that's why we see only the islands um, of divergence for the uh, flower color genes. Now this uh, picture of, uh, of evolution and incompatibilities, although we've been able to study it to some extent through our analysis of these very closely related species may actually be of very broad significance. Let's to, to see that we need to think about or go back to our map of uh, genotype to phenotype and its relationship to fitness and function.
because so far this this picture that I've shown you genotype is independent of environment so that the environment influences how the genotype and the phenotype interact but the environment itself is independent of the genotype but we've just seen through things like habit growth habit genotype can influence environment so that if something has a spreading habit for example it's going to do better and survive more in slope environments than say cliff environments and so your genotype will influence where uh, where the where where the plant will grow, the genotype influences the environment, and that's what allows evolution to explore different paths in this model that I've shown you, uh, because the genotype is in interacting also with the environment and so shifting uh, the adaptive landscape. And then when species have come into contact again, then the situation can arise that one solution uh, meets an incompatibility with a different solution. Now, this situation is not specific to uh, these closely related species. It, it can apply to species in general. So if we go back to our example of our species adapted to their environments, we see that the, the frog and the lily pad are both actually good solutions for surviving and reproducing in the same environment, this aquatic environment but they're incompatible with each other in the sense that if a frog could reproduce with a lily pad uh, and have offspring, those offspring would not do terribly well in this environment. So each represents, in a sense, a good solution to this problem. There is no single optimization of one solution to the adaptive problem. We end up with multiple solutions, a frog and a lily pad. The same applies here with a polar bear and the pine tree. Both represent good solutions that are adapted to this cold environment, but obviously hybrids would not uh, hybrid forms would not do very well and the same is true of the cheetah and the grass. Now this divergence or these barriers between these different good solutions arose in these cases much much earlier in evolution over much bigger time scales than the one that I've been talking about. They arose way back in the ancestry when frog and lily pad lineages uh, diverged. Nevertheless the processes that allowed them to diverge, that allowed these barriers to establish and uh, start to become established uh, may be precisely similar to the ones that I've been describing for the flower colour genes. The flower colour genes represent in a sense our chance to see that process in action in a small scale, a small enough scale that the barriers still allow us to do genetic analysis to study the origin of these barriers. But with time these barriers would increase and intensify such that you would end up with completely incompatible uh, and reproductively isolated populations, but that nevertheless can uh, give you different solutions to the same problem. So that instead of seeing evolution as this optimization, this adaptation to a given environment um, through, uh, through an optimization process that comes up with a single solution, we start to see evolution in terms of multiple solutions arising but with incompatibilities between them. And that's what allows so many species to live together and be adapted to common environments rather than giving us a single dominant species that dominates our Earth. And on that note, uh, I'd like to finish, but I'd like to first thank the people involved in this work. This work was a collaborative study that involved groups, an international collaborative study. So in, in addition to our group at the John Innes Center, we've benefited from collaborations with Simon Moxon and Tamash Dalmo's group at the University of East Anglia, particularly on the analysis of the small RNAs and the role they play in gene regulation. We've also benefited enormously from collaboration with Yong Biao, the Xu's group in Beijing, who've done the bulk of the sequencing work that I've described, and also Nick Barton and David Field in, in Austria, uh, David Field is now in Australia and they have worked critical for the population genetic analysis that I described. Well on that note I'd like to finish and thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Well, thanks a lot Rico, fantastic talk as usual. <laughs> so we have a few questions now from the audience and uh, I'm going to try to select them. Some of them are uh, related to each other. So Alejandra Moreno, um, who is an expert on population genetics in, in pine trees, she's asking, what could be preventing the yellow phenotype from expanding geographically? 
Okay, so um, if you have a barrier, well, let's take let's the analogy of driving on the left and driving on the right. What prevents driving on the left and driving on the right expanding beyond its boundaries? Okay, once you have a boundary, it's actually very difficult for the boundary to shift. It could shift very slightly, but because of the incompatibility, you will end up with boundaries that tend to sort of stay reasonably fixed in position. So we know already actually that the hybrid zone, I mentioned that it was already documented 100 years ago um, with these specimens. We've been monitoring the hybrid zone. It hasn't actually shifted very much at all, if at all, over the years that we've been monitoring it. So actually it's very difficult for the barrier to shift because you've got the other species with an incompatible solution. So how are you going to invade the other species, which is what you'd need to do if the yellow is going to spread and displace the magenta. So um, basically, these hybrid barriers are going to make it very, very slow. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen over thousands of years, thousands of generations. There might be You'd expect these barriers to shift maybe over that type of time scale. But in the shorter time scale, there's no reason, there's no drive for them to, to shift unless one of the phenotypes was superior. If yellow had a selective advantage over magenta, then gradually yellow would displace magenta. Similarly, if magenta had a selective advantage over yellow, it would uh, invade the yellow. But if they're reasonably similar solutions, the barriers basically will pretty much be very hard to shift. Okay. We have, a, obviously, we have a few questions about pollinators. And since we have here in the Institute of Biology several experts. I'm going to read them first because I think all of them are related. Aren't there different pollin uh, he meant pollinators preferring different flower colors, maybe in different locations or habitats? I'm going to read the next one. Um, what did you know about the influence of pollinators in these two solution, in these two solution to that flower? And there is another one uh, from Hernan Vasquez Miranda. Uh, are there any differences between pollinator preference between the yellow and pink phenotypes, or are there more than one species of bees, each selecting one color over the other? And he says, what about the variation? Well, uh, what about the variations uh, given uh, the UV lights and pollinators that could follow? So I guess all of them are related. That's why I decided <laughs> to put them all together. <laughs> okay, let me take that. Great question. So let me take first the easy, the easiest one is the UV. It turns out anti rhinum flowers don't reflect UV. So uh, therefore, the only colors that they be is seeing is red, uh, is, sorry, is green and blue. They have the green, they have green, blue and uh, UV receptors. But the U UV receptor isn't there. So actually, all they see is green and blue. Uh, sorry, the UV receptor is there, but the UV reflectance is, is not there. So all they're seeing is green and blue. So it's a bit like a bee is a bit like a colorblind person, a human that can't see red that can only see green and blue with regard to the snapdragon flowers. Okay, so we don't, we're lucky, we don't need to worry about the UV in this case. Now the pollinator questions are very interesting because uh, for, for, for the following reason, they show us the first thing you think about, and it's very interesting, the first thing you think about when you see the yellow and the magenta, two, two populations with different phenotypes, is there must be a difference in the environment. It's ingrained in us as biologists. <laughs> as evolutionary biology, it must be a, a difference. And so we, we looked and we saw we, what you find is that both the yellows and the magentas are pollinated uh, by an, what's called a pollinator assemblage. It's not that it's just a single species that pollinates each species. Uh, Actually, multiple, you'll find multiple pollinators, different species of bees, different um, pollinators, but the flowers can be opened and pollinated by a group, uh, by an assemblage of pollinators. But we found precisely the same assemblage were pollinating the, the flowers on the yellow side as the flower on the magenta side. And so, um, so, so we'll come back to what's going on in the hybrid zone. But on either side, we find that the, 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 uh, the same pollinators. Now, when you say this to people, they sometimes think, yeah, but you haven't checked. There must be some subtle difference and so forth. And I think it's to do with the brain. Okay, <laughs> If you imagined going to 
the, the take again driving on the left or driving on the right or take the road signs if you looked at that as a martian you say there has to be a difference in the environment in mexico from england that explains why they drive on the left in one and they drive on the right in the other there has to be an environmental difference we are absolutely brain our brain tells us there has to be an environmental dif difference or the road signs there has to be a reason that in, in mexico they have a yellow background and in england they have a white background there has to be a, an, a reason, a fundamental difference in the environment. But there isn't, okay? There is no reason. It's historical, and it's to do with the incompatibility. So that's what I really want to emphasize here. We are so ingrained in thinking in terms of these, this kind, we don't think in terms of incompatibilities. Our first mindset is to go to an environmental difference. But actually, environmental don't, don't account for these things. And if you think about it, culturally, Things like language is another example. There is no, you know, Spanish is not superior to English. They're different. And yet we have all these different languages. And if you were looking at this from the outside, you'd say, oh, well, there must be an adaptive reason for speaking Spanish in hot countries, say, and Italian. And, but there isn't. It's not the environment. It's, it's the history. It's the incompatibilities are arising from the history. So that's um, really a fundamental thing that I want to get across. Now, when you look at the... the um, one of the mysteries that we still have is figuring out what's going on in the hybrid zone, where these colors are mixing, because our fitness experiments indicate that the hybrids have lower fitness. They're, they're producing fewer, fewer seed. Um, but why is that? And one idea we have is that maybe the pollinators, what, what's in a sense, it's rather like the signs I was talking about, that the flower has to produce signposts effective signposts for the bee to enter the flower and get the nectar. And any flower that's slightly better at producing, uh, more efficient, or if the signpost is better, the bee will more efficiently carry out the pollination and, and detect the nectar and also carry that pollen to another flower. All right, so there's very strong selection on having very clear signposts. And that's why we think that in the hybrid zone, it's the clarity of the signposts that is causing this fitness difference. But we have yet to demonstrate that. So we're trying to do that experimentally, find ways of testing this, uh, the, the, the rate at which and the facility with which bees enter these flowers with different signposts. So that's ongoing. But, um, and so I can't say that we know the answer to why they're going for one or the other. But I do think that this issue of incompatibility is fundamental, that you, you cannot actually understand evolution if you don't think in terms of these incompatible solutions, because otherwise you would ask yourself, why is there not only one species, the best species on this planet, and only one species? The reason we have multiple species is because we have multiple solutions to given problems, all right? There are multiple solutions to surviving in an environment, which is why we have multiple species. If there was only one solution, we would only have one species. And if you want to understand these solutions, you, you come to the issue of incompatibilities. That is, some combinations work better than other combinations. So the environment is not going to explain to you why a frog and a lily pad coexist in the same environment. All right. You wouldn't say, oh, well, there must be some environmental difference that's explaining that. No, the frog and the lily have an incompatible set of, of, of genes that, that provide alternative solutions. So that's, I think, the key idea that I want to get across. The pollinator questions are excellent, but I think we need to think, get escape from at the same time, thinking always there has to be an environmental difference that's accounting for a, a phenotypic variation. And to, to follow up on this question, to rule out the, the possibility of the pollinator, have you, do you have any evidence, for instance, uh, with this experiment similar to the ones uh, Beverly Glover does of flower choice? So you, you have a bee in a controlled environment, and the bee sees a yellow flower, magenta flower, or a, a orange flower. Have you do you have any evidence on that? That oh well, so Beverly Glover, that's a good question. So these are some of our early thoughts that maybe we could discriminate it that way, that through some sort of choice. So far, those experiments have not revealed anything. All right, I think Beverly, in fact, tried to do these these choices, which is why we're thinking that maybe it's related not so much to choice but to the efficiency of pollination, that is that how effective these signposts are. But you're quite right. These are the sorts of experiments that we now need to do to figure out exactly what is causing the bee, what's, what's causing this difference in fitness. Because that's the big question mark. We still don't 
we still can't answer. What characteristic is it that the bee is going for that's causing, and is it the bee? Oh, is it the pollinators? <laughs> okay, we, we have not demonstrated that. We're assuming that based on these signpost phenotype. But it's still an open question. I see. Um, Gerardo Salazar, who is an expert on orchid biology, he says, well, thank you for illuminating talk. Uh, have you explored the possibility, the possible interaction of flower color and floral fragrance in your study system? Yeah. So that's another good question. People have looked at, at flower scent and didn't they, there were mixed reports. Some people thought that they did find flower scent differences, others not. We, they've never been any scent difference that was... The trouble is that if you take two individuals, they may smell differently. You've got to show that the... Um, that the scent of the yellows is consistently different from the scent of the magentas. So nobody has so far, people have tried to look at this and nothing convincing has emerged. But the other thing is that you need to think about uh, if that was true, okay, if there was a difference, why don't we see it in the genomic signatures? In other words, when we look at the genome, all we find is flower color. If the scent, for example, was important, we would expect to find an island an FST island over a scent locus, all right, that wouldn't have anything to do with flower color that was related to scent. So we don't see anything like that. So why don't we see that? And I think it's to do with this co-adaptation. Okay, so if you think about it, a signpost requires a number of things to get right, okay? So certain genes have to work well. If you, for example, mix the background with the foreground, it doesn't work well. So these, these combinations don't work very well. With scent, it might be simply that if, if a scent is more attractive to the, to, the, to the pollinator, that allele will just spread through the population. There isn't this, well, that's the interesting question. Is there a combination of scents that works, that, well, this combination works really well, and this combination works really well, but the hybrid combinations don't? If that was the case with scent, then you'd expect maybe something like these barriers to arise from scent. But simply a, a, a trait that is simply selected for need not be one that leads to incompatibilities. All right. So it may be that the bee doesn't go for these, these sort of bouquets, specific bouquets that are incompatible. Maybe the bouquets are compatible. Maybe they're like Starbucks. All right. It's only peculiar traits. Maybe flower color signpost is one of them that are going to exhibit this type of incompatibility. And that's why we only see those when we look for these um, FST peaks. So, um, we think it's very unlikely, actually, there's any other trait in the system, in this particular system, because otherwise we would detect other traits that are not linked to flower color as discriminating between the populations. Okay. Well, following, that, following on that question and knowing how critical you are about your own research, <laughs> didn't you think it was, uh, you know, too perfect to only find flower color genes? And now that you added um, the cliff, I mean, the, the dwarf phenotype and the, and the white flowers, wouldn't you expect that if, they, if the white flowers with dwarf phenotypes, plants with dwarf phenotypes are the link between yellow and magenta, wouldn't you expect that dwarf phenotype loss side are segregating also in the, in the yellow and magenta flower species? Well, so that's the interesting point. In a sense, they're, the dwarf loci are like Starbucks, okay? So imagine you um, you look, you have to, okay, so Engl England, so the, so the people leave the of England and go and um, live in America or in America, let's say. And then there's a cultural separation between them and they diverge, all right? So they diverge in their accents, you know, they diverge in their habits. And in America, they invent Starbucks, okay, which was not invented in the UK. So now you have two populations that are very different, all right? And there's a massive ocean between them, and there's very little passage between them. Now you open up the passage and you let them exchange. So some things will exchange very easily, like Starbucks. But there'll be some things that don't exchange so easily, like the accent, the American accent and the British accent. They don't exchange so readily. Or driving on one side versus driving the other side. Those don't exchange readily. So, but those are rare traits. The bulk of them will exchange readily. Okay? So um, that's what I'm trying to say, that even though if you go back in terms of the dwarf habit and so forth, there would have been 
ancestrally many many differences maybe between these species the only ones where the barrier in this particular case the only ones where the barrier was evident was with flower color because that was the one like driving on the left or driving on the right it was just that rare trait that showed this that happened to to show this co-adaptation that this incompatible solutions and everything else basically the best one wins so so the alleles in a given environment, the best alleles will spread, whichever those will be, depending on the origin of the species. It's not related. Um, it's not related to an incompatibility. Okay. So we have a question from Alejandra Cujarrubias, who is a, an expert on molecular biology in, in plants. She's asking, have you looked at the association of this color pattern distribution in other plant species? In other words, I guess, have, you, have anyone else or you found similar cases in other species? So, yeah, there's a fascinating case uh, also in Spain, in Linaria. So Linaria is a, a, a different genus from Antirhinum, but it has similar, um, it's got similar closed flower. And uh, it turns out that there's magenta species with a yellow highlight in Linaria, and there are yellow species uh, yellow flowered species, exactly the same. And plus, there are hybrid zones between the two. So we find exactly the same patterns where you see, you know, the same signposts, all right, the, the yellow one and the magenta one, um, and hybrids forming. Um, and we're analyzing the basis of that. However, there, it doesn't seem to fit this idea of the white. We don't find a white cliff-dwelling um intermediate that we can point to so there, there's a situation where it kind of fits but we don't understand what how you go from one to the other because we're scratching our heads about that actually one of the things we want to check is the uv reflectance maybe uv is involved in that case and we're only seeing the visible light and we need to look at the uv but yes these things do occur in for other traits and um in, in other species, at least in flower color. Now, there might be other traits that we can't see. Um, flower color is one that we can see very readily, so we pick it up. There might be other incompatible traits that we can't see um, that would emerge from genomic studies, all right? As people do more and more genomic studies, maybe they will find some incompatible traits uh, related to other, other phenotypes. But so far, flower is a very convenient one for picking these up in the first instance. And you do find them in other in other plant species. You also find a similarish situation in butterflies with different mimetic types, different signatures of of coloration on 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 butterflies. Um, so yes, I think it's it's not specific to antirhinum, but I think the point is that the logic of it is incredibly general. I would say, in the sense that species divergence whether it's flower color or chromosome incompatibilities or other types of incompatibilities, flower color is just one instance of an incompatibility. If we looked at animal or plant evolution, we'd see all sorts of loci um, on an evolutionary time scale. So what, what I mean by that is, if you, if you, in the example I gave you of, of UK and uh, America, we both, still speak English, all right, or American, whichever way you want to say it. <laughs> um, and there are a few differences, like the accent and driving on the left and driving on the right. But if, if the period of divergence had been longer, then other differences would have arisen. For example, they, you know, Germany or European languages divided up much earlier and we know an English person cannot understand an Italian or a Spanish or a, a German unless they learn the other language. So there, the, the, the divergence is much greater. It's just that, so in evolution, I would expect that the, the processes that we're talking about, these incompatibilities are quite rare. But if you give them enough time, lots, they will gradually, you'll get more and more of them, all right? It just so happens that flower color is quite a quick one to evolve in in plants, all right, because of the strong selection pressure on flower color and reproductive success. So, but these traits are going to accumulate, not just in flower color, but in other things as well. All right, so you'll start to build up more and more incompatibilities, which mean that eventually when species meet, they'll no longer uh, cross. So what, I'm, so what I'm talking about, the logic of what I'm talking about 
is incredibly general. It's applying to, in my opinion, it applies to all plant and animal species in a sense. It's to do that the incompatibilities is what makes, allows these different solutions to evolve and coexist. Okay, if they didn't have these incompatibilities, when the species came together again, they would be able to, they would be able to interbreed, all right, and there wouldn't be a problem. You would just end up with a mush. In other words, every species, all the species would swarm together and form one mixed species. The fact that they're all separate is to do with these incompatibilities. That's the, that's the I'm I'm trying to say. So the principle of what I'm saying is incredibly general. If you want to understand why there are multiple species, the problem of speciation as opposed to the problem of adaptation. So Darwin understood or put forward a theory for adaptation, but he never understood speciation. He never understood why species become different, why barriers arise between species. And this is saying that now we're starting to see how barriers arise between species. And it's through these incompatibilities that these are arising. And the reason you get incompatibilities is because you have multiple solutions to the same problem. There, are, there is no single solution to a given adaptive problem. Okay. We have another question from uh, an undergrad student whose name is Victor Velasco Tapia. He says, in other countries, could you find those species of plants? Uh, what are those countries? And I want to follow up on that, on that question. Uh, I guess, I mean, 10 years ago, when you went to the fields, uh, into the Pyrenees with Christophe, you saw this phenomenon for the first time, but now on their different eyes, whenever you see uh, antirhinum species meeting together, are you able to identify these hybrid zones more often? Like if you say, oh yeah, of course, it's happening again, as you say. Um, no, not as clearly as, yes, you can see hybridization between species, but nothing is clear that the, the hybrid zone between stratum and pseudomagus is, is particularly clear um, because I think there's been sufficient exchange of the other low side that you're only left with the flower color difference. In many other cases, you'll find hybrids between species, but there hasn't been sufficient exchange that you can kind of sift sift out just these specific genes. So actually, um, in the species group, there are about 20 species of antirhinum in Spain and, uh, and Mediterranean. To my knowledge, the example that I gave you is the clearest of a genetic segregation affecting just a few loci. The others are more um, more complex. You have hybrids, but they're they're not so frequent. And there's nothing as clear as this um, that I've ever come across in all my years of collecting antirhinum. Um, in terms of where antirhinum grows, uh, you only find this group of the species group of antirhinum and its close relatives in Spain and um, Portugal and, and France and Italy, in the Mediterranean. There are new world uh, species, sometimes called antirhinum, but they're a taxonomically very different group. You find those, for example, in California. So, um, so yes, yeah, so basically antirhinum majus, or this, this, this species group, or this group of closely related species is only found in, in Europe. And you can't cross the European ones with the new world ones but you can intercross all the European ones. Okay. And uh, we have one more question from uh, Margarita Collazo, and she's asking about, if you can talk more about the, why you have this difference between the dwarf and the, and the erect uh, phenotypes, and, and what did, and I, I want to follow up on that question, and what, what are you gonna do to figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> so, what we're trying to do is, what we'd like to do is see if we can identify some of the genes by, by doing genetic analysis between more distant species. So for this, we would take species with dwarf habits or spreading habits and tall habits and see if we can identify the genes um, involved. And then um, also see if we can do pollinator experiments where we take the color genes and integrate them into different habitats, in, into different habits. And so we can see, does the habit, growth habit, influence the success of different flower colors? Are the genes involved in these different habits? Have they undergone selective sweeps? So although they wouldn't show FST differences of the kind that I've been talking about, they might nevertheless show evidence of selective sweeps if they've been discriminated between these species. So yeah, so we're trying to think of experiments to go into the genetic control of some of these growth habit genes but that's a very much, that's quite a big challenge. And um, 
but maybe armed with the power of genomics, um, we might be able to make some progress. Okay, Rico. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, we have these are most of the questions that we have. We have a lot of congratulations from a lot of scientists here in Mexico, from uh, some of them from the from the UK. Uh, I will pass you the comments later on, uh, and I think uh, uh, we can close the, the session. And I want to thank you uh, for giving this fantastic talk uh, on, on obviously your ideas and your findings on evolution of antirhinum taking. Uh, and Reino may use a uh, model system for doing this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I want to say that Professor Cohen has a lot of research on, on modeling on how growth happens at different uh, uh, complexity levels. So hopefully in the future, we will get to hear Rico Cohen again, but they're talking about different things. And uh, I just want to leave here the link to Rico Cohen's webpage, where you can find uh, obviously all of his work and also the links to one of the latest books that he published from Cells of Civilizations, where he talks about his ideas on evolution, uh, speciation, and so on. So thanks a lot, Rico. Thank and you. We are going to just uh, finish the session with uh, the rest of the co-organizers. So on behalf of my colleagues, and now I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to Spanish. Uh, de parte de mis compañeros, la doctora Alejandra Moreno Leterier, el doctor eh, eh, Lázaro Guevara López, eh, los organizadores de esta primer serie de eh, seminarios Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución, les damos la más, eh, eh, el, 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 el agradecimiento por habernos acompañado, por haber hecho promoción a estas series de seminarios y pues los esperamos el próximo año a esta serie de seminarios. Muy pronto vamos a estar sacando la convocatoria para eh, pues, que nos hagan propuestas eh, sobre líderes en, en los campos de la sistemática, biodiversidad y evolución. Y pues eh, también se conformará un nuevo equipo, pero por lo pronto eh, queremos darles las gracias de parte de nuestra y también de parte de eh, los diseñadores gráficos Diana Martínez Almaguer y Julio César eh, Montero además de la directora eh, Susana Magallón Puebla. Pues muchas gracias. No sé si quieren agregar algo, Lázaro y eh, Alejandra. Pues muchas gracias a todos. Eh, la asistencia ha sido muy buena y las preguntas han sido incluso mejores. Y pues estén listos para la próxima serie de seminarios. Igualmente, muchas gracias a todos y por favor eh, compartan los videos para que lleguemos a, a más gente. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues con esto cerramos la sesión. Thanks a los Rico. Muchas gracias, sí. Lazo. Muchas gracias, Alejandra. Y nos vemos la próxima. Chao. Chao.